of alcoholics, Irish Catholic family, and I've been through growing up. Our only way to cope was alcohol, and I. This is a story of recovery. The beach relaxes me as well as um, horses over there. And um, I've been diagnosed with PTSD, and this is about my recovery in a psych ward. That's me right there, over there, in a psych ward. And it's, I'm still recovering from alcohol and trying to get better, but um, that's my recovery story. Thank you. <laughs>
This gallery is up here, this is uh, Mental Health Awareness Month. This is the first day, but it's up through the whole month of May. And we'll look for a lot of uh, folks from all over the, uh, all over the world come to visit. Um, also wanted to thank um, the contributing artists. We have a beautiful art gallery here. Well, if anyone's got some artwork, please stand up. Let's, let's give those folks a hand. We've talked some of them. Beautiful, beautiful art gallery. Event. These things just do not help happen without the partnership. The members of staff working side by side, all this stuff, <clears throat> you know, from the program to the artwork to just getting everybody over here um, and the work. We're fortunate, I was going to say the food, but we were, we're blessed that we we're at, we had Deb Gurry from uh, the Bell Tower Cafe put this beautiful cafe together for us. But even then, just bringing the water and everything over there. One thing we have is the most incredible partnership, members and staff working together to work in, in, in the mission of developing those important opportunities for members of jobs, housing, social recreation, health and wellness, and obviously creative arts too. Um, we're very glad to have some of our folks from our main aid, from the main office in the agency. Uh, Christy, our friend of the Director of Clubhouse Services, Christy Price, in the house. Ralph Henry, from our Chicago's office. Uh, Agency President Bruce Burr was talking to the I see Tanya Manor from the CBS office, the Operation Administrator. Um, our friends from the Haber Clubhouse. Woo! We're honored to have the Executive Director of the Mass Clubhouse Coalition, Reba Stein, is here. And all of our family friends. We did have an advisory board member, she had to leave. Um, and of course, if I missed you, we walk in to thank you for your participation here being here. It's just being here is uh, is a big support for all of us. Um, let's see, if I had any, uh, the guest speakers, I want to thank them. Uh, we are very fortunate, and I'll be introducing her a little later, uh, in having our old friend Ruthie Poole in the house. Thank you. Great to see you around And this is live, this is live, being taped live right now by Ginny Alexander from Lawrence Cable Television. Ginny, yeah. looking forward to working with her on future productions, Frame of Mind, the thought-provoking TV show about mental health issues here in the Merrimack Valley and around the world that we work in a partnership with the Lawrence Cable Television. Um, and our volunteer guest artists who, who really stepped up and were so supportive in making this all happen. Where's Kathy Gray? Let's hear Kathy Gray. Yeah. <laughs> so the mayor's running a little late, but so I think we can start the program. We're kind of winging is that. So I'm going to ask uh, my good friends, Clubhouse members Anna Harris and Chelsea Cabo to come on up. So, hi everybody. Hi. hi. My name is Anna Harris. I am a longtime member of the Point After Club. Um, I've been a member for three years off and on. Um, so this is about before stage four where they have the advanced screening. Uh, you can take a little, a little um, survey to see if you are 
have any signs of mental illness, which is really important for me because as a college student at Landmark College in Vermont, I, there is no such thing as advanced screenings for mental health, even though as a student with learning, with a learning disability, there will, there will, you know, I would have really benefited from that. I mean, it sounds silly, but if there was a survey that could, in existence that could have helped me to understand what was going on in my life with isolating and not really taking care of myself the way I should have, then maybe I would have been able to successfully seek out the support. But, you know, the, I don't know for what Vermont is like in the area of mental health, but um, at the time I didn't really have any groups on campus or um, any places to go as a counselor. I mean, that was a blessing, but if this would have been more of a blessing, I probably would have been able to, you know, figure out ways to help myself better and also just move forward in life and learn how to, you know, take care of myself. And I would have been able to successfully save my life if maybe stop something that's more serious and trash like that. What happened in 2009 when I was diagnosed with bipolar and had a psychotic break on the campus as an alumni by myself and when I, and no no one was really around just um, not having not knowing what to do when there was no adult on campus. There's there are obviously professionals on campus but they didn't know what was going on at the time. And I'm still denial. <laughs> <laughs> So, I guess it's should I start with Thank you. So, hello, my name is Chelsea, and um, before um, I uh, managed to be successful in my stage of intervention in my life, um, in terms of the stage of intervention, um, I was, um, you know, di first diagnosed at the age of 19 with a major mental disorder. I do not wish to disclose this disorder because I'm still afraid of the stigma behind it. But it's like, it involves psychosis and some like mood disorders and a combination of these two or either one. And um, I um, started off like in school, like not really making sense with what I'm saying, just like, you know, it's, in it's like, there's a the word for it, it's like called inco incoherency, and um, it wasn't until I moved um, from that area, that part of Massachusetts up north to the Merrimack Valley, that I uh, found so many services and so many supports that was available for me. And if it wasn't for all the help and, and the support I received in the stages of my recovery, uh, I don't know what would have become of me a bit. I feel very like grateful that I've come this far. I live in it in my own apartment. If it wasn't for like, okay, I'm gonna mention this. I've been hospitalized. I've been in the system. I've been institutionalized. I've been having like all those different type of issues and stuff. And also was dealing with my emotions. But um, it all improved when I stayed in a group home and then to support housing that's like a step further until I finally got my own place like like I manage my own money well, like I can maintain my house, like I can cook sometimes I want to cook if I want to. <laughs> <laughs> we understand. Yeah, yeah. I, I can be on strike too if I want to. <laughs> Every time I want. I don't have to follow other people's rules or demands or anything sure. like that. Because I'm my own place and I manage my own money and um, you know, now I'm in a relationship which I'm very happy about, you know. I'm happy, so uh, be, without further ado, I'm going to have Anna um, start her speech. All right. <clears throat> when we think about cancer, heart disease, or diabetes, we don't wait years to treat them. We start before stage four. We begin with prevention. 
When people are on their first stage of those diseases and beginning to show signs of symptoms, like a persistent cough, high blood pressure, or high blood sugar, we try immediately to reverse these symptoms. We don't ignore them. In fact, we develop a plan of action to reverse and sometimes stop the progression of the disease. Cuando pensamos en la enfermedad de cáncer, enfermedades cardiovasculares o la diabetes, nosotros no tardamos por años para curar. Antes de comenzar la cuarta etapa o B4 stage 4, B4 stage 4 um, ya cuando la gente está en la primera etapa comienza a mostrar síntomas como la tos constante, presión alta o altos niveles de azúcar en la sangre. Ya tratamos inmediatamente de cuidar estos síntomas. Nosotros no lo pasamos por alto. En realidad, nosotros desarrollamos un plan de acción para cuidar y a veces prevenir el desarrollo de estos enfermedades. So why are we doing the same for individuals who are dealing with potentially serious mental illness? When you are someone close to you start to experience the early warning signs of mental illness, knowing what the risk factors and symptoms are will help to catch them early. Oftentimes, family and friends are the first to step in to support a person through, through these early stages. Experiencing symptoms such as loss of sleep, feeling tired for no reason, feeling low, feeling anxious or hearing voices should not be ignored or brushed aside in the hopes that they go away. Like other diseases, we need to address these symptoms early, identify the underlying disease, and plan an appropriate course of action on the path towards overall health. Mental health conditions should be addressed long before they reach the most critical points in the disease process, before stage four. Ahora, ¿por qué nosotros no haremos lo mismo para la gente a quien sufren estas posibles enfermedades mentales serias? Cuando usted o alguien cerca de ti comienza a mostrar los primeros riesgos de enfermedades mental, mentales, conociendo los factores y riesgos y cuáles son los síntomas, les ayudará a prevenirlo a tiempo. Muchas veces, las familias y amigos son los primeros para la intervención al detectarlo a tiempo. Sintiendo los síntomas como la falta de sueño, sintiéndose agotado o agotada, sin ninguna razón, bajo sentido de humor, sentir ansiedad o de escuchar voces, no se debe ignorar o pasarlo por alto y esperar que se da, que desaparezca. Como cualquier otra enfermedad, tenemos que prestar atención a estos síntomas a una etapa más temprano, identificar la raíz de la enfermedad y planear un curso de acción apropiado para un paso hacia la salud completa. La condición de la salud mental debe ser atendido mucho antes que alcance los más estados críticos en el desarrollo de la enfermedad before stage 4 o antes de la cuarta cuarta etapa. Many people do not seek treatment in the early stages of mental illness because they don't recognize the symptoms. Up to 80% of the, 84% of the time between the first signs of mental illness and first treatment is spent not recognizing the symptoms. Mental Health America screening tools can help. Take it online at www.mhascreening.org. A screening is an anonymous free and private way to learn about mental health and see if you are showing more signs of a mental illness. A screening only takes a few minutes and after you are finished, you will be given information about the next steps you should take based on the results. The screening is not a diagnosis, but it can be help a helpful tool for starting a conversation with your doctor or a local one about mental health. Muchas personas no buscarán tratamiento a la etapa temprana de la enfermedad mental porque ellos no conocen los síntomas. Un 84% de los tiempos entre el primer señal de la enfermedad mental y, el, y en los primer tratamiento se tarda no reconocer los síntomas. Mass Health, uh, Mental Health American Screening Tools o la detección de la salud mental de América le pueden ayudar. Buscando en línea a la red de la red a www.nhascreening.org un método de detección anónimo es gratis y la manera privada para conocer acerca de tu salud mental y ver si tú estás mostrando los riesgos de la enfermedad mental la detección, detección solo se toma un par de minutos y después que deben de tomar basado de los resultados la detección no es un diagnóstico, pero un método para ayudarte a comenzar una conversación con tu doctor o ser querido acerca de tu salud mental. This May is Mental Health Month. Point after Club and Midfin are raising awareness of the important role of mental health, of, of mental health and to take action 
immediately, they are experiencing some wounds of a mental illness. Mental illnesses are not only common, they are treatable. There is a wide variety of treatment options for mental illness, ranging from talk therapy to medication and peer support. It might take some time for a person to find the right treatment or combination of treatments that works best for them. But when they do, the results can be truly amazing and life-changing. Queen Africa and Vipin want to help people learn what they can do to both protect their mental health and know the signs of mental illness before stage four. Este mayo es el mes de la salud mental y el Point After Club Vinfin está llevando a cabo el avivamiento con el papel importante de la salud mental y tomar acción inmediato si ellos están experimentando síntomas de la enfermedad mental. La salud, salud mental no solo es común, pero se puede mejorar. Hay una gran variedad de opciones para el cuidado uh, de la salud mental en base a la terapia, en las medicinas, hasta un apoyo de grupo y puede tomar un tiempo para que las personas se encuentren el tratamiento adecuado o la variedad de tratamientos que les ayudarán a mejorar. Pero cuando se logran los resultados, se, pueden ser maravillosos, realmente maravillosos. El Corea de la Vivente quiere ayudar a personas a conocer qué pueden hacer mejor para proteger su salud mental y conocer los señales de la, de la enfermedad mental y postecho. It's up to all of us to know the signs and take action so that mental illness can be caught early and treated, and we can live up to our full potential. We know that intervening effectively during early stages of mental illness can save lives and change the trajectories of people living with mental illness. Be aware of your mental health and get screened before stage four today. Está sobre nosotros saber los señales y tomar acción para que la enfermedad mental se pueda detectar a tiempo y ser tratado. Y nosotros podemos vivir nuestra vida a nuestro alcance total. Nosotros sabemos que la intervención efectiva durante la etapa temprana de la enfermedad mental puede salvar vidas y cambiar el camino de personas que viven con la enfermedad mental. Presta atención a tu salud mental y hágate la prueba before stage 4 ahora. This, this program is going to be filmed on uh, cable television. That's why it's really important for us to translate in Spanish, too. And we're thank you, ladies, thank for doing a service to our community here and presenting this stuff. <laughs> we have, at the desk back here, we have a, the, we, we partner with Mental Health America to do this Mental Health Awareness event, and we're using their materials. Uh, and there's a really good thing about the risk factors, um, early warning signs and symptoms, you know, get help, and then Hope. There is hope for a lot of, a lot of uh, folks, and there is a lot of folks uh, in recovery. Uh, there was an article that I was reading, the World Health Organization said that the median age of someone from the first stage of symptoms to getting some type of services is 10 years. Wow. And you know, you know how damaging you that can be to a person, not to get yeah. services, wait, wait 10 wow. years. Think of other illnesses, how they progress. And that's, that's a very uh, significant uh, statement and uh, we want to get the message out there that early intervention is crucial for recovery. Thank you ladies. Thank you. So the, the mayor is not going to be able to make it today. It's a very busy day, um, but we do have, uh, I'm fortunate to have a representative from the mayor's office that will be coming. And first we're going to have uh, uh, the president of our agency, uh, Ben Fenn, Bruce Burris speak. He's a demonstrated committee, uh, look at the mayor's one name, OK. So he's been president since 2008, chief executive officer of uh, Ben Fenn, which is the leading provider of services here in the Merrimack Valley. Um, through contracts, the Department of Mental Health has, our agency has contracts with community-based flexible supports, the program for assertive community treatment, transitional independence program. See a lot of these, some, all, most of the group home facilities, um, some of you folks are working in Midfriend, maybe there's some other programs too I'm not, that I may not be covering. But the, and of course, of course the clubhouse, right? Hey! Yeah. 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 
but you know, it's, it, I, I think we, last year we talked about collaboration, and I think things are getting a lot, you know, even better than they were last year. Uh, and, and we are very fortunate in this city to have a lot of community partners that are committed to, this, to the, the work of, and the development of the people, in, particularly in, in, uh, in mental health. Uh, so we're very proud to work in this, in this city with all the folks that we work with. Uh, at this point, I'd like to introduce Bruce Berg to come on up and make some comments for us here. I always start off by telling you this story. Some of you have heard it, but if you're wondering how Ben Fenn got this unusual name, it's very important to hear about this as our history because in 1977, people lived in hospitals for years. Might be some people in this room who did. And in 1977, a group of psychiatrists and social workers at, at Harvard at the Mass Mental Hospital decided we want to figure out how to help people learn to live in the community again who'd lived in the hospital for years. So they founded a nonprofit company. They bought a house right next to the hospital and they began to help people learn to live in the community because they help them move to that house and learn how to shop and take transportation, get a job. And long before people worried about putting labels in the titles of company that might be considered stigmatizing, like psychiatry or behavior, they were way ahead of time. And they said, we don't want that in the title of the company. What are we going to name it? Well, we're on the corner of Vining and Fenwood Road. That's how we got the name, Vin Fen. So I was talking to Keith, a member here earlier, and he said, are you going to tell the street corner story? <laughs> and I did. So our mission today, we've grown to be very large. We're the largest Department of Mental Health partner in this part of the state. We take that very seriously. We work with the department to try to help provide the kind of support and resources to people in recovery and families and people who and to reach out to people who need to get into recovery and treatment. We take that very seriously. But 37 years later, our mission is the same as it was then. It's to help people who have serious psychiatric conditions to live in the community and to live productive and happy and valued lives as full members of the community. That's what the clubs do and that's what our community-based flexible support services do. We're trying to support folks in recovery to live full, valued, and, and productive and happy lives in the community. So our job, my job, I'm a psychologist, and my job with the executive team that runs VinFan and the, not, the volunteer board is to try to figure out how to support all the good frontline staff out there who are doing the real work to help you all who are in recovery, because we know it's difficult work. Our, the, the tagline under VinFan used to be transforming lives. We changed that a few years ago to transforming lives together because we realize the real work is done by the people in recovery and we have a lot of wonderful staff who are helping together and we engage, as Tom said, a lot of community partners, DMH, other community resources. We're all caring together to transform lives and that's what we're all about. And the last thing I want to say is Tom's message of getting treatment or interventions early is so important. There's still an enormous amount of stigma to be overcome. Part of why we do things like this is to get the message out to the general public. If you or your loved one needs help, please reach out and get it. Because unlike when I started, I was a freshman young psychologist at the Johns Hopkins Medical School. We thought we knew a lot. We really didn't know a lot about 35 years ago. We now know that people with the most serious psychiatric conditions can recover and live those full, happy, productive lives, get a job, do all the things that so many of you are doing. And, and what people need to do is not be afraid, but to reach out and get the help they need and get on that path. And that's what, we, that's what we're all about today. So, May is Mental Health Month. I hope you enjoy the celebration. Wonderful art in the back, great celebration today. And please keep up all the good work, those of you who are in recovery and those of you who are our staff and community partners, and thanks to the mayor who's been a big supportive of this, and uh, thank you all for having me. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, so the mayor was not able to make it today, uh, but fortunately he has a special assistant, Elizabeth Delgado, will be here to announce the proclamation. 
One thing we know that we do have a friend in the mayor's office. Um, he has a commitment not only to our members but to this whole city about driving and developing opportunities and making us all proud of the city of Lawrence. And uh, so he's a good friend of ours. Um, and he's also, um, as mayor, actively involved in the mayor's health task force, which we've been involved with for years. We have the behavioral health work group. But it is, it is a model for community partnership in, in, within not only in, in Massachusetts, but around the country. Uh, there is so much collaboration and partnership with not only mental health, but other agencies around wellness, health and wellness activities. So proud to be part of that organization also. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to bring up Elizabeth Delgado to read a proclamation to proclaim the Mental Health Awareness Month here in the great city. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you all doing today? Great. Um, I'm really happy to be here on behalf of the mayor's office. Um, as it was mentioned, Mayor Rivera could not be here this afternoon, and he does send his apologies, but he also sends his warmest commendations and best regards to all of you, and he's very happy um, for those of you who are in recovery and taking this step for mental health and for mental health awareness. Um, so. Mental illness is actually uh, mental illness is actually something that's very important to Mayor Rivera. Um, here in the office, we do connect residents who come to our office with resources um, that are available in the community. Um, we have a wealth of resources in our office, so if any of you ever need any assistance, you're always welcome. Our doors are always open to you all. Um, so I just want to just encourage you. If you ever need anything, we are here for you. Um, so with that being said, I want to just read and proclaim the month. Um, so. For Mental Health Month 2014, the B4 Stage 4, um, be it known that I, Daniel Rivera, Mayor of the City of Lawrence, and on behalf of the residents of the City of Lawrence, Massachusetts, by this proclamation hereby observe Mental Health Month 2015. Whereas mental health is essential to everyone's overall health and well-being, and whereas all Americans experience times of difficulty and stress in their lives, and whereas prevention is an effective way to reduce the burden of mental health conditions, and whereas there is a strong body of research that supports specific tools that all Americans can use to better handle challenges and protect their health and well-being. And whereas mental health conditions are real and prevalent in our nation, and whereas with effective treatment, those individuals with mental health conditions can recover and lead full productive lives, and whereas each business, school, government agency, healthcare provider, organization, and citizen shares the burden of mental health problems and has a responsibility to promote mental wellness and support preventative efforts, prevention efforts. Therefore, be it known that I, Daniel Rivera, do hereby proclaim May 2015 as Mental Health Month in the city of Lawrence. As mayor, I also call upon the citizens, government agencies, public and private institutions, businesses, and schools in the city of Lawrence to recommit our community to increasing awareness and understanding of mental health. The steps our citizens can take to protect their mental health and the need for appropriate and accessible services for all people with mental health conditions. Now therefore, I set my hand and affix the seal of the city of Lawrence, Massachusetts, this first day of May in the year of our Lord, 2015. All right. that then Finn, um, I hear so many great things about your organization as well. And I just also want to congratulate you. Any staff that's here, please stand up. You all deserve, any staff from any of the mental health agencies that are here, please stand up. You, you, you all you. deserve a round of applause. It's so important, and we know how you know it's not easy. So thank you all for what you do. I actually personally know a few of the mental health counselors at the Lowell Infant Office as well. So um, and nice to see some familiar faces like Mr. Rantes uh, here, who does a lot of work in the community as well as his wife. Yeah. Um, Residents and friends in the city of Lawrence who are going through the through recovery or are receiving services, please stand up as well. You all receive a round of applause. Thank you all for your commitment to 
go to go through this work. I know it's not easy, but keep on going and keep on you know keep on fighting the fight, as we say, right? So um, just continue with with your uh, your goals in life, and uh, wish you all many blessings. Okay, thank you so much. Consumer advocate, you talk about someone who's dedicated, and this person, there's no one more dedicated than I know of in the field uh, at protecting the rights and welfare of individuals with, with lived experience of a mental health condition. Uh, and we've been blessed to have her. We had her, it's been seven years since you've been gone, Ruthie, huh? Eight. Eight years, oh my God. We had Erin Lawrence for a long time, and she coordinated the Lawrence Organizing <laughs> Voices for Empowerment, which went right to the State House and actually created, changed, changed some bills, changed, changed law. You have the Six fundamental rights because of the love group. Six fundamental rights because of the love group of the advocacy of Ruthie and a lot of our members. That's good, a lot of our members. Um, and now she's gone on. She's been involved with Empower, Empower significantly over the years. She always was involved with them, I believe. Um, Transformation Center um, is where she's at now. She's out there training people to become peer facilitators. And peer specialists. And peer specialists. That was the word I was looking for, really. It's doing some peer specialist training, so we're getting a whole body of well trained people with lived experience about work in the field. So, and Ruthie's a big part of that, spearheading that. Um, and of course, she, first and foremost, is a friend of the Point After Club. We're honored to have her come and speak with us here today. So, come on up, Ruthie. That was such a nice introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, some of you knew me when I didn't need reading glasses. Well, at age 50, the eyes went. Yeah. <laughs> some of us can relate. Yes, I can <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm so honored and thrilled to be speaking to you today. When Tom saw me at the State House a couple months ago, he invited me to the celebration. I thought, wow, I've been invited to come back home. <laughs> In 1989, I had no gray hair, this is gray, uh, no wrinkles, these are wrinkles, and no teenagers, maybe that's the wrinkles of the gray hair, <laughs> when I first visited the Point After Club over on Garden Street. Tom and his dear mother Rose invited my friend Jim Shaw and I to come over from the Northeast Independent Living Program, NILP, on the other side of Lawrence, and lead a discussion group with members in the basement. We weren't using the words at this time, but that was probably one of the first peer support groups in the mental health peer movement in Massachusetts. At that point, we were not even using the word consumer to describe ourselves. Most of us called ourselves clients, some of us called ourselves patients, and the more politicized people among us called ourselves ex-patients or psychiatric survivors. A few of those people who attended those early groups are here in the room, and I want to thank you all, and I'm really afraid I'm going to leave a couple people out, so please don't take it serious. It's uh, personally. Some of those people are Beverly Albertassi, <laughs> Joan Madolo, she was here a few minutes ago, Joan. Um, Jeff Thea Harris, he was here a few minutes ago, Jeff Thea Harris, uh, Heath Adamson, and poor Irene, I never learned to say her name correctly. Irene, your last name is... Uh, Paul Zuckerman, so I don't know Okay, I'm going to have time to do it. Paul Zuckerman. So, um, uh, my kids go to Malden, my kid goes to Malden High, and they have 77 first languages. And do you know how many different languages I can massacre last names? A lot. Uh, other people include Chelsea, Carol, and Gloria Roman. Some of those early participants are club members who died much too young, like Nancy Lee Harridan, 
Steve Schumann, Joe Hinckley, and Bill Capone. I miss them all dearly, and they will always have a special place in my heart. In those groups, we shared our hopes and dreams and our desire to transform the mental health system into a more person-centered, strength-based, and what we now refer to as recovery-oriented system. Back in the day, we weren't even using the word recovery. Pat Deegan, one of the heroes and great thinkers of the peer movement, both nationally and now internationally, was Jim's and my boss, right here in Lawrence, mind you. And she encouraged Jim and me and the folks in the discussion group to support each other and push each other to dream big. Yay. You see, by Point After Club inviting us to have our peer support slash consciousness raising, that's a very 1970s word, uh, right here, they were the, one of the first allies of the mental health peer movement. In 2006, when it was time to collect support letters for a grant proposal to create and fund the Northeast Recovery Learning Community, an organization run by and for people with lived experience, Tom Coppinger, the director of the Point Ever Club, was the first clubhouse director to write a letter to DMH supporting our proposal. As people with lived experience of mental health diagnosis, trauma, and or addictions, we want to transform the mental health system, but we cannot do it alone. We need strong allies, like my friends here at the Point After Club, who will not speak for us, but will support us and speak on our behalf when people say things behind our backs that are hurtful and oppressive. Those folks joined with others to form the Love Group, as, as Tom mentioned, Lawrence Organizing Voices for Empowerment, a grassroots activist group solely made of people with lived experience. The Love Group often met at the Point After Club. You see, uh, my friend Suzanne lives in Medford, and she has a very South Medford accent, so I'm not going to be able to do it because you can hear my Midwest twang still all these years later. But she'd say, oh, Ruthie, you're a bit of a diva. I think that comes from the Irish American background. You're a bit of a diva. And as she would, she, as I love to say to Judy, Judy to Jesus, who, was, who now works with adults with physical disabilities, but was the secretary of NILP at the time, Judy, I'll be out for the rest of the day. I'm going to meet the love group at the club. Can you imagine what strangers who heard, overheard what I said must they have been thinking? Well, the Love Group went on to win many victories, including getting a written informed consent policy at the Greater Lawrence Mental Health Center. This was before the internet, but the Eagle Tribune covered it greatly. Which, that required clinicians to not only give their clients verbal informed consent for medication, but also written informed consent. That is, psychiatrists and others that prescribe medication had to not only tell their client the nature of his or her illness, what drugs they were recommending, but also about the side effects, risks, and alternatives. There was a form that they had to fill out with the client together, which both the client and clinician signed that was placed in the client's medical record. This was groundbreaking, as many of us have been sorely affected by the side effects of psychiatric medications. So that's a little bit about me and how I ended up here at the Point After Club 26 years ago. But now I want to talk to about the club itself. When I mentioned that I felt like I was coming home, I really meant it. Although I was not an official member of the club, hopefully you all considered me to be an honorary member. One of the most beautiful parts of the clubhouse model is the absolute right to return. That is to go away for what may be several years, in my case, eight years, and be welcomed back with open arms. The secret on why the Point After Club is so special can be summed up in one word. That's an easy word that we learned early on, the word love. This place is filled with love. Many of us in recovery have felt unloved at times in our lives, but when you come to the Point After Club, love surrounds you from members welcoming new folks and giving them tours and making them feel comfortable, to staff 
such as my longtime friends, John, and where did Elvin go? He's hiding. Um, so that's John, and Elvin was right there. Um, to states, when someone is struggling in the day, they would stop, no matter how busy they were, to give a friendly ear. And I'm hoping that that was mutual support, because what we're based on is really mutuality. Because mental health, in fact, I think is a continuum. We all have struggles. At times, life is very hard. And for all of us, at times, life is very joyous. And I hope you all can celebrate that joy, because the hardships we unfortunately sometimes get stuck in, myself included. The other thing I want to say about the Point After Club is they've been in the forefront of social justice. What I mean by that, what I mean by that is at the first clubhouse at the State House always is the Point After Club, you folks. Whether it be being trapped in the Speaker of the House's office, Speaker Finnerin, with a number of you, and uh, Don Hughes from Riverside, and Jessel, uh, I forgot Jessel's name, uh, who was a young adult leader. Um, but people at the Point After Club understand that it's not just a fight for better services, but it's a fight for economic justice. <coughs> that what very often we're disabled by is the poverty and the violence around us. In my old age, and, and you know, now I can say outrageous things because I'm over 50. Ha! I Before I wasn't given quite the pass that I'm given now. So I realized that leadership starts at the top. <coughs> The leader of an organization sets the tone for everyone else. The love that is the magic of the Point After Club was established by Rose Coppinger and, her, and my friend, her son, Tom. They opened their arms and their doors to my brothers and sisters who had been locked up at Denver State Hospital for many years. With that love, they helped folks adjust to living back in the community what Bruce Bird was talking about earlier. After having been locked up for many, many years. Some of you may still be in the room. I know several of you have passed, I'm afraid, our friends. They provided a welcoming safe haven from the poverty, the street drugs, and the violence that too often surrounds us on the streets here in Lawrence. Since his mother's retirement, Tom has continued to provide that loving leadership, while always treating my brothers and sisters with lived experience, with dignity, respect, and compassion. Tom, you are one of my heroes, and I'm proud to call you my friend. Thank you for inviting me today to let me speak. It's a great honor to me. I really feel like I have come home. Thank you. I'll give you the check after you leave. <laughs> <laughs> I brought up the tissues because yeah. I knew I could, every time I practiced, I couldn't make it through without crying. So, oh, it's emotional. Well, Ruthie, you are certainly one of my heroes, too. So let's give it up for Ruthie. I'm going to have to find my glasses this time. We have a final comment. <laughs> So all month, this is Mental Health Awareness Month. We have this beautiful art gallery. Tell your friends, and if you haven't, please sign our book here for the, uh, for the recovery, yes, recovery yes. through art, art gallery. Here. Yes. Uh, so before I call up the artist, I did have one, one thing to say. Um, it's a little thing I got out of the uh, Club Boss International website. And we can talk all about the, the difficulties, you know, people not getting uh, diagnosed early. Uh, but there is hope. There is hope for people living with mental illness. People can regain their mental health, but not with medication alone. People with mental illness are successfully participating in society through a combination of medication, community support services, and relationships that ease the way from isolation to full participation in life. As we see with so many of our members here and other folks all around the Commonwealth and the country. Thousands, as it says, of good examples just around the world of people with mental illness not merely integrated into the community, but playing a socially productive and economically important role. 
The emergence of clubhouses and other rehabilitation services in many countries around the world demonstrate through a growing body of evidence that people with mental illness can successfully participate in society through education, employment, and other social activities. And my hat's off to all the folks in here that are doing just that. So thank you all. Uh, we, did, I know, we did want to uh, put an emphasis here today on our beautiful art gallery, uh, Recovery Through Art. Um, and I'm not sure if any of the artists, I know, Kathy, did you want to come up for a minute here and make, say a few words? <laughs> this is our volunteer artist. Uh, and there have been so many members, uh, along with, with, with Kathy, uh, Julia, Julia Sullivan, our communications and our social recreation person, and have worked with the members. Uh, actually, Jen McDonald, if she, did Jen leave? Jennifer's still here, she helps, uh, is a peer facilitator. Come on up, Jen. Come on up, Jen. Come on up, Jen. Uh, I created an expressions group. Uh, if any of the artists would like to come up, better, uh, come on up. Larry. Come on, up. Come on Larry. Yeah. Chelsea. Chelsea, come on up. Marianne, if you'd like to come up. Jerry Leonard. I've got to come up here now. You guys are the star of the show now. I'm going to put it in your room with Kathy first. Makes a comment. Lori, you have a piece up? Oh, she's going to remain hidden. Okay. Uh, we oh, won't make her come up. It's okay. <laughs> we have choice. Amen. Hey, she's making a choice. We empower. Right. Yes. Art empowers everybody. You just have to choose to do it. And then do it. It doesn't matter how you create, whether it's cooking, sewing, painting, drawing, whatever your spirit says to do, do it. Don't keep it hidden underneath a, a rock. Because your spirit needs to shine, and it shines through art. Oh. And I love my group here. <laughs> we have a good time. <laughs> okay, so um, I made um, a little art project called uh, Happiness Contagion. And it's basically, the meaning of it is a star and it's spreading out and it's like shooting up little stars all around it. So, cool. And it, like in a cloud, like it, it's a picture of that and surrounding it is a cloud of just like um, darkness and it's just shooting right through the darkness. So that's part of my artwork that's in the art gallery right now. And by the way, again, in case you guys didn't get my name, uh, it's Chelsea Carvajal. Um, hello, my name is Sherry Lenhart. Um, I have been associated with VinFin for more than seven years now. And through the last three years, where in 2012, I had four surgeries, 2013, one surgery, and 2014, another surgery. Both VinFin and Alternative Healthcare, which is also in contact with VinFin, have helped me through all of these operations and my ups and my downs. Aww. Thank you. Mike. Oh, it's Mike. I'm sorry. Um, I have a picture in there that's uh, cherry blossom, which is made out of punched hearts and circles. There are dogs and cats and um, frogs and bunnies and a whole bunch of different stuff that um, I put together um, with punch holes, hearts, and whatever. And that's up there. It looks cute. Thank you. Hi, my name is Michael McNeil. Um, a little history about what I did is, um, this is in the art gallery. Um, I wrote a poem, but before I read it and everything. It's on, it's on. Oh, okay. um, I thought that uh, I would not, I have, uh, I always had the uh, passion to write poems, but I thought I could never do it because I thought poems had to rhyme. Mm -hmm. 
But uh, back in 2003, I was in the hospital and this gentleman was sitting there writing a poem to his sister. And I asked him, how do you write poems? And he goes, it's easy, just sit down and write how you feel. So he helped me with my first poem ever, what's called Memories of You. And ever since then, I wrote poems. And this poem, what's in the art gallery, is called A Club Is by Michael McNeil. A club is a place for help, a place for support, a place for rehab, a place for meetings, a place for growth, a place for friends, a place for expressing yourself, a place for freedom, a place for a better life, a place to belong, a place to return, a place where everybody is somebody. And, and that's what I truly believe a clubhouse is. Hello, my name is Christian Gutierrez. I did a picture in the Heart Gallery. It was a black building with blue skies and the yellow sun. That's all I want to say. <laughs> Larry Willis. Um, I'm new to the um, White Apple Club. I've got two pieces in there. One is a picture of an old fashioned city it's called Bay City Streets in the 70s. Oh, 70s, very well. And um, I did another one. It's a vortex with three ghosts and um, something like that. Kind of cool. I'm grateful to find the uh, point at the club. So my name is Julie. Uh, I am honored to work for the Castor Unit. I'm honored to work for the Clubhouse. And I'm honored to um, have the pleasure of working with such a fabulous peer facilitator. Whoever did Whoever trained you did a great job because this girl, she is just so welcoming and she just grabs people in and she says, you know what, let's just even start at the, at the coloring. You know, as a staff, I've been trying to get people away from the coloring pages and just kind of starting with the creative process. But sometimes it's hard when you don't feel like, I've heard so many times, I think we both have heard this, well, I just don't draw, and I just don't do art. I just don't have that in me. And I think every one of us, if we challenge ourselves, we do have that in us. And sometimes those coloring pages help to, to give us a start, and from there we, we think about other things. So, you know, just heads up to, to Jen for being such a great peer facilitator. Kathy, for your warm, infectious spirit. Everybody loves having you, and we Love having you here on Fridays and stuff, and um, shameless plug for the creative expressions group. So, if you're around two o'clock on Mondays and Fridays, we'd love to have you. I guess she doesn't want to talk much. <laughs> That's okay. She talks enough in the club. <laughs> Let's give it up for the honors there, folks. How about those musicians from the Hammer Club? Yeah. 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 Thank you. Everyone has a great weekend. We're going to conclude the event this time.